Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is proving to be a provocative one, a very thought-provoking one, entitled Preparation for the End Time. Now we've gotten down to lesson number 10 in that series for June 9 of 2018, entitled America and Babylon? Hmm, what's America doing with Babylon here? Well, we'll find out. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Father, we now ask for your presence among us. We know that you're here at all times, but we recognize your presence as we seek to discuss these very important truths in a way that will be understandable to all those who are listening. And to us as well, Lord, may it become as clear as possible as we speak, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, for those of you who know a little bit about America or the potential discussion of America in the, in, in the Bible, you will know we, we're going to focus on Revelation 13. In Revelation 13, we, do, we see two strange beasts. Look first at Revelation 13, the first couple of verses. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. It had ten. So notice first it comes out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads. On each of its horns there was a crown, and on each of its heads there was a name that was insulting God. The beast looked like a leopard, with feet like a bear's feet, and a mouth like a lion's mouth. The dragon gave the beast his own power, his throne, and his vast authority. So that's the first beast. And then actually we can just go back there again and look at um, verse, starting with verse 11. Then I saw another beast which came up out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb's horns and it spoke like a dragon. Lambs? Dragons? How did they go together? It used the vast authority of the first beast in its presence. It forced the earth and all live on it to worship the first beast whose wound had healed. So those are the two beasts that we're going to try to talk about today and try to figure out who they belong to and what are they going to try to, to teach us. So this sea beast, what do we know about the sea beast? Well, the first thing you notice is there's a lot of interesting characteristics of this beast which are very much like some other animals we've already read about in the Bible. In fact, all the way back in Daniel chapter 7. Let's just look at those really quick. There's four beasts in Daniel 7. The first one was looked like a lion, but had wings like an eagle. While I was watching, the wings were torn off. The beast was lifted up and made to stand upright, and then a human mind was given it. The second beast looked like a bear standing on its hind legs was holding three of us between its teeth and so forth. And then while I was watching, another beast appeared to look like a leopard. On its back there were four wings, like the wings of a bird, and it had four heads. So then there's this a nondescript beast, this fourth beast that had, um, it had ten horns. While it starting to stop, uh, I'm sorry, earlier it says it has, no, it just has one head, but ten horns. So now, out of these four beasts, how many heads do we have? We have one lion, one bear, four leopard, leopard, and one nondescript beast. That's a total of how many? Seven, I think. Seven. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And how many horns do we have on this last beast? Ten, Ten horns. Ten, yeah. So altogether, these four beasts have seven heads and ten horns. And lo and behold, we come over here to, to Revelation 13. What do we find? Here's the beast that has ten horns and seven heads. And it looks like a leopard. Now, if you look back in history, Daniel was looking forward. So he saw first the lion, which was Babylon. Then he saw the bear, which was Medo-Persia. And then he saw the leopard, which was Greece. Now, if we're looking backwards, what's the sequence we see? A leopard bear, lion, right? And that's exactly the sequence we have here. Now, you think that's an accident? No. Or is there possibly some relationship here? 
Well, the dragon gave the beast his own power, his throne and his vast authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have been fatally wounded, but the wound was healed. And I, I guess I should be, to be honest, I should drop back to chapter uh, 12. Look at verse 3. Another mysterious sight appeared in the sky. There was a huge red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and a crown on each of its heads. So we now have the dragon with these seven heads and ten horns. And we have the first of these other beasts with seven heads and ten horns. It's getting to be a multitude of heads and horns, isn't there? And then we're going to talk about another beast. We'll do that in a little bit later. Um, this last beast in Daniel 7 has two phases to it. There's this nondescript beast, this terrible beast with iron teeth and brass claws or whatever. And um, then it's, it, it, the next thing is a, a, this little horn speaking blasphemous things. Um, however, this very bizarre beast in Revelation 13.3 one of the heads of the beast seemed to have been fatally wounded, but the wound had healed. The whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. So we got lots of crazy stuff going on there. So let's just review really quickly some of these characteristics of this beast. One, it arose in heavily... He Why do we say it arose in Which heavily... Which beast are you referring to? Revelation. This is the, the first beast of Revelation 13. So this is verse, verses 1 through 10. And where does this beast come up out of? C. C. Heavy and what does that mean? Heavily populated. A heavy populated area, according to uh, Revelation 17, 15. <laughs> so it ruled over the whole world using power that resulted from an amalgamation of the powers of the three previous powers, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. So what great power arose ruling over the whole civilized world following Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece? Rome. Rome. Obviously Rome. It speaks blasphemy against God, claiming to exercise the authority of God. And when did that happen? Well, the, the Caesars claimed to be God, so mm -hmm. that was the beginning of, mm -hmm. of, of And it's going to persist, as we're going to see, through the little horn and so forth. It gets its power from Satan itself, and what does that imply? It's a religious power. It receives a mortal wound, and, but the wound is healed. Uh, and we're going to look at that possible comparison between that and Jesus' death and resurrection. It amazes and rules over the whole world, verses 3 and 4, and then 7 and 8. It causes the whole world to worship the dragon. So somehow or other, this beast is going to cause the whole world to worship the dragon. And of course, who's the dragon? Satan. Satan. It will rule with authority for three and a half years or 42 months or 1260 days using the old um, uh, Hebrew calendar. Then it began to curse God, his name, the place where he lives, and all those who live in heaven. Revelation 13, 6. How is that going to happen? Take its place. Take mm -hmm. God's place. It will fight against God's people and defeat them, exercising authority over the whole world. It will be worshipped by the whole world except for God's faithful chosen people. Wow. So, do we have evidence that the, the Pope exercised that kind of power? Oh, yes. There's a famous story about Roman, the Holy Roman Emperor, Henry IV. And he upset the Pope. By that time, it was Gregory VII. And what happened? He thought he'd better make things right with the Pope again. He came down to the Winter Palace where the Pope was staying, and the Pope wouldn't refuse to even see him for three days. He made him stand outside in the cold, waiting to be seen. And so thereafter, the Pope claimed what? I can bring down kings. Well, unfortunately, or maybe we should say fortunately, that power came to an end. How did it come to an end? Well, there was the Reformation, first of all. Then there was the 
Enlightenment, then there was the French Revolution, and also the rise of the American power, where many of Rome's enemies escaped to establish a new nation. Rome's political and religious powers waned to the point that Pope Pius VI was taken captive by the French army under General Berthier in 1798 and later died in exile in 1799. And everybody said, what? Catholicism is finished, right? <coughs> is that what God said? No, he described the de deadly wound as being what? Healed. 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 Today, Catholic popes are described by news media as the most powerful people in the world. Does that sound like things have been healed? Popes in our day are invited to speak to the United States Congress to make pronouncements about political issues, etc. <coughs> Many people don't realize this, but relatively short period of time <coughs> back, anything to do with Catholicism was like absolutely forbidden here in the United States. Mm -hmm. In light of all this, will we go along with this political correctness and show respect to the Pope? Well, we should be respectful, but will we carefully but graciously present the message of Revelation 13? How can we make that message meaningful and understanding, <laughs> understandable to the masses? How can we do that? Well, let's, let's take on the other beast there. Revelation 13, let's read verses 11 and 12. Then I saw another beast which came up out of the earth. It had, so coming up out of the earth means what? Not out of prior Not out of heavily or densely populated areas. It had two horns like a lamb's horns. Now that would be something coming up looking like a lamb. Should remind us of whom? Who was the great lamb in the Bible? Jesus, right? Jesus. Yes. Yeah. Revelation. So you would think, okay, this is someone who's going to be like Jesus. Well, it's someone who wants to be like Jesus in some ways. But it speaks like what? Like a dragon. It used the vast authority of the first beast in its presence. It forced the earth and all who live on it to worship the first beast whose wound had healed. So the power comes from where originally? Satan. And he gives it to whom? Sea beast. The sea beast. Who in turn gives it to who? Land beast. The land beast. So, who's the power directly behind these two beasts? The dragon. Let's not, let's not miss that. So, say it out loud. Okay. So, the land beast gets its power from the sea beast who gets its power from the devil himself. Just, we need to make that as clear as possible. Now, People who were part of those organizations may not feel comfortable with that idea, but that's what it says. About the time of the end of Rome's power during the 1260-year prophecy, and when did that prophecy begin and when does it end? 538. 538 A.D., the time when the Bishop of Rome first assumed military and civilian authority. Okay, and when does that end then, 1260 years later? 1798. 1798. A new, about that time, a new nation rose in an area not heavily populated. Revelation 13, 11, and 11, verse 1, and Daniel 7, 2, and 3, and Revelation 17, 5. There's the, there's the evidence. So how are we going to determine who the new beast represents? There is only one nation that fits all the descriptors. What nation of the new world was in, 19, no, in 1798, rising into power, giving promise of strength and greatness, and attracting the attention of the world. The application of the symbol admits of no question. One nation, and only one, meets the specifications of this prophecy. It points unmistakably to the United States of America, and that's from Great Controversy, page 440. Could the day come when the United States would exercise power unknowingly, I'm sure, that comes directly from Satan? Yes. Well, well, so what will be the issue in this 
swap of power, this, this, this passing on of power. Since the beginning of the great controversy, Lucifer, now Satan, has wanted more than anything else to be worshipped. That has been his goal. Somehow he even thought he could convince Jesus Christ to worship him. You remember the temptations, the third temptation there. So what should we expect to happen in fulfillment of this prophecy? Will the whole world actually become religious again? What's going to happen? Any idea? The whole world wonders after or worship the beast. Well, I mean, do you see everybody going back to church? No, they, they subscribe to an evil system that, okay. that is controlling and manipulating and deceiving. So you're talking about some kind of a new religious... No, it's, it's been creeping on for a long, long time. Yeah. It's just, it's just that... But in relatively recent times. Yeah, so. and well, and, and we think the only way we can c get other countries to do their bidding or knuckle under is have more guns, more power, more weapons. And uh, ultimately what happens, you, if God just lets it happen, people just collapse on the whole system. Mm -hmm. For a while after 9-11 in 2001, Everyone did go back to church. Well, not everyone, but a lot more people went back to church. About a week. Made them um, think a bit. Maybe, maybe two weeks. <laughs> okay, it's a stretch, but it's well, Maybe a little it. more, but it was a, well, quote, revival, end quote, mm -hmm. or a false revival. Well, in the book of Daniel, we go back there and we read about three young men who had a very interesting experience. What happened to them? They were expected. They were called out onto a broad plain, and there were thousands of other people out there, and the king had set up what? A golden statue Statues. of himself. And when the music played, what were they supposed to do? Bow down. Bow down. Bow down. And what did these three young men do? <laughs> Stood up straight and tall. Stayed right there. And what happened to them? They were threatened with being burned alive, right? I think they were warned ahead of time, and so oh, then, yeah. they, then they were thrown in. And, and? You know, when they say it was said, they heated the uh, furnace seven times hotter, it was, it was seven, it just means they made it as hot as it could get. I mean, yeah, it's the, the seven times, you like, yeah. and Isaiah talks about the sun was seven times brighter. You know, it's just as hot as it can be. I think yeah. it's, a, it's a metaphor of it, yeah. saying you can't make it any hotter. Mm -hmm. Well could argue that a little bit. They were silversmiths and goldsmiths, and they knew darn well you had to up the ante. Oh, I understand that. Yeah. Yeah. Whether Where they had thermometers, who knows, but there were degrees of heat. Oh, yeah. But seven times, uh, that's, I was, uh, seven yeah. in theological terms means the uh, uh, ultimate perfection yeah. or yeah. ultimate and so on and so forth. In any case, we know that God preserved those three young sure. men. Could that happen again? Could yes people's lives be threatened once again? I think it's almost guaranteed. Well, shall I read it to you from the Bible? Is that a good clue? Mm -hmm. Revelation 13, verse 15. The second beast was allowed to breathe life into the image of the first beast so that the image could talk and put to death all those who would not worship it. What does that sound like? If you don't worship, what happens? Extortion. Uh, they, the, the, Satan's plan was to kill him. Anybody? I understand, but yeah. but you, they yeah. play on. Everybody has to deal with fear and greed, mm -hmm. and those that like to control use deception and extortion to get people to knuckle under. So I want to take a few minutes to look at some really important passages in Revelation. We just read Revelation thirteen fifteen, Satan's threatening to kill anybody who doesn't knuckle under his plan. But look at Revelation 14, verses 9 to 11. A third angel followed the first two, saying in a loud voice, whoever, worship, whoever worships the beast and its image, that's what we just read about in Revelation 13, and receives a mark on their forehead or on their hand, will themselves drink God's wine, the wine of his fury, which he has poured at full strength into the cup of his anger. All who do this will be tormented in fire and sulfur before the holy angels and the Lamb. The smoke of the fire that torments them goes up forever and ever. There is no relief day or night for those who worship the beast and its image for anyone who has the mark of its name. So, there's another side that says, no, if you don't worship on our side, you'll be wiped out. Well, look at 
chapter 16, verse 2, the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth. Terrible and painful sores appeared on those who had the mark of the beast and on those who, were, who had worshipped its image. So it's, even before they're killed, there's going to be plagues falling out on them. And then look at chapter 19, verse 20. The beast was taken prisoner together with the false prophet who had performed miracles in his presence. It was by those miracles that he had deceived those who had the mark of the beast and those who had worshipped the image of the beast. The beast and the false prophet were both thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. Wow. And then finally we would come to chapter 20, verse 4. Then I saw thrones, and those who sat on them were given the power to judge. I also saw the souls of those who had ex been executed because they had pro proclaimed the truth that Jesus revealed in the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image, nor had they received the mark of the beast on their foreheads or hands. They came to life and ruled as kings, in Christ, as kings with Christ for a thousand years. So what do we see here? Why is worship such a big issue? Those who do not worship the dragon will be threatened with death. Those who worship the dragon will be destroyed by God's wrath. Three, the land beast will try to force everyone to receive the mark of the beast. Without the mark, no one can buy or sell. But four, people will be deceived into receiving. What is God's wrath? destroyed by God's wrath. Yeah. Does God have to destroy or God just let the evil run its course without protection yeah. to those? We, we could show very clearly from Scripture that God's wrath is, is just turning away in loving disappointment from those who don't want Him anyway. Thus, They've chosen. They've yeah. chosen to not t listen or leaving take instruction. Them, leaving them to the inevitable consequences of their own rebellious choices. One day, those who refuse to worship the dragon or the beast or to receive their mark will rule on thrones in heaven. So we've got two clear opposing sides set up here. There's no question about it, right? Well, what do we know about the background of Babel or Babylon? Where does the word Babel or Babel come from? Gate, or the gate of God. Gateway of the gods. It means gateway to the gods. Like Lucifer in heaven, Isaiah 14, 14, those original tower builders back in Babel thought they could defeat God's plans. Genesis 9, 8 to 11. Later in the second great Babylonian empire, Nebuchadnezzar boasted of this great Babylon that I have built, Daniel 4, 30. Once again, boasting of human right and power. Later, his grandson, Nebuch Belshazzar, used the golden vessels from Solomon's temple where did those come from? Those are supposed to be used only by the priests and worshiping God, right? To serve intoxicating wine to his guests on the night Babylon was destroyed. Thus we see that Satan will do almost anything to abuse or misuse even utensils intended for the worship of a true God. Well, if a form of false worship is going to return to our world, what form might it take? Dennis, I think you've got that one. Yes. Multitude. Mul Is there that a term? It's supposed to be an S. Yeah, that's what stopped me there. Multitudes have a wrong conception of God and his attributes and are as truly serving a false god as were the worshippers of Baal. Many even of those who claim to be Christians have allied themselves with influences that are unalterably opposed to God and His truth. Thus, they are led to turn away from the divine and to exalt the human. Patriarchs and prophets, uh, oh, 177. Prophets oh, prophets and kings, I'm sorry. 177. Wow. Think of the incredible implications of that statement. Let's look at the first line there again. Multitudes have a wrong conception of God and his attributes and are as truly serving a false god as were the worshipers of Baal. Could that happen in our day? How about a person that preaches that uh, the, uh, we're going to be tortured for eternity? Hmm. Is he, is, is that, isn't that a false concept of God? Mm hmm could people in our day not, I mean, stepping aside from the pulpit, what about people who worship fame or riches or political and military power through business or the stock market or even Hollywood? 
I mean, you look at some of these award shows. That's all idolatry, is it not? Yeah. Which is a false concept of, of God. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, boastful pride of life, all of those uh, we can see in uh, Eve's downfall, the temptations, uh, might even see them in those first three kingdoms because yeah. they're given an extension of life even after the, the fourth beast is destroyed. So uh, it couldn't be just the political powers. There's yeah. there are, uh, spiritual forces that we're battling against. Absolutely. Well, in, in several places in the Bible, for example, several verses in Jeremiah 51 and Zechariah 2, Revelation 17 and 18, from these passages we learn that ancient Babylon, and by implication modern antitypical Babylon, was full of immoral lust. One day God will treat her as she deserves, and his warning is to all who will hear and obey, get out of her and run for your lives. <clears throat> well, what have we noticed about the comparisons between the dragon, the sea beast and the scarlet beast as described in Revelation 12, 3. Let's just look at those verses again really quickly. Revelation 12, 3. Another mysterious sight appeared in the sky. There was a huge red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and a crown on each of his heads. Okay? What do we know about that dragon? Satan. Well, Why then... Why was it red? Huh? Why was it red? Well, let's hold on. We're going to try to see that. Revelation 13, 1 to 3, Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads. Sound familiar? On each of its horns there was a crown, and on each of its heads <coughs> was a name that was insulting to God. The beast looked like a leopard, bear, bear, lion. We read about that. The dragon gave the beast his own power, his throne, and his vast authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have been fatally wounded, but the wound had healed. The whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. And then we jump over to Revelation 17, Verse 3. Give me just a second and get my thing going on here. And what do we find? The Spirit took control of me, and the angel carried me to a desert. There I saw a woman sitting on a red beast that had names insulting to God written all over it. The beast had seven heads and ten horns. Hmm. What's going on here? Do these beasts sound a little bit alike? Very much, yeah. Okay, Gary, I think you have a comment about that. All three beasts have seven heads and ten horns, which represent the sum total of heads and horns of the beast of Revelation at Daniel 7. Each successive empire was built upon those that went before. Similarly, the Scarlet Beast combined elements of the dragon and the sea beast, symbolized by pagan and papal Rome, respectively, as well as the land beast, Revelation 13, 11 through 14, grouping all three powers all of God's enemies into a real coalition. Okay. Who is that? Jacques Dukan, Secrets of Revelation, the Apocalypse through Hebrew Eyes. He's giving us, a, it's recorded, quoted in our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Wednesday, June 7. Okay. Well, there's another very interesting thing about those two passages. Um, look at Revelation 12, verse 14. Uh, actually, we should start with 13. When the dragon realized that he had been thrown down to the earth, he began to pursue the woman who had given birth to the boy. Now, who's the woman? Who's the boy? In this context? The church. The woman is the church. Who's the boy? Christ. 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 She was given the two wings of a large eagle in order to fly to her place in the desert, Right? where she will be taken care of for three and a half years, safe from the dragon's attack. Now, we read earlier, I'm not going to go back up there, she's dressed in white and all this kind of stuff. And what we go, what happens to her next, do we know? 
Well, now we come to Revelation 17. The Spirit took control of me and the angel carried me to a desert. Now, who was out there in the desert? There's this woman dressed in white and who pursues her out there? Dragon. The dragon, devil himself. There I saw a woman sitting on a red beast that had names insulting to God written all over it. The beast had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet, which is sort of variations of red, and covered with gold ornaments, precious stones, and pearls. In her hand was held a gold cup full of obscene and filthy things, the result of immorality. So what's happened here? So it does, there are a couple possibilities. One is that the woman, the church, tamed the dragon, mm -hmm. and it's now its, its beast of uh, its horse or whatever. Mm -hmm. The other is that the dragon corrupted the woman. Seems most or like the latter. there's a third possibility that the answer is both. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Very likely. They corrupted each other? Yeah. Well, very interesting. There are some very interesting parallels between these two women. The pure woman of Revelation 14, I mean, Revelation 12 had, was in heaven originally. She was clothed with the sun. She had a crown of 12 stars. She was attacked by the dragon. She was the mother of the remnant. But then we come over and we find this other woman and in Revelation 17 is described as a harlot or an impure woman. She's sitting on the waters. She's, well, she's sitting on the beast, which is, comes out of the waters, clothed in purple and scarlet. She's adorned with gold, gems, and pearls. She's supported by the dragon. She's the mother of harlots. Could these two women be the same woman? <clears throat> One thing that's always bothered me, the, women, the woman here, if it's the church, mm -hmm. that woman birthed somebody who was that Jesus how can the church birth Jesus when the church wasn't created yet until after Jesus was gone well the 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 idea was that that she would the church would represent God's faithful people all through history from Adam and Eve to the end so, so he was born from them Mm -hmm. The right. Jewish Jewish faith, yeah. you know, Jesus said salvation is of the Jews. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, that could it, be it, true. It just seems a little weak to me. I don't know. Yeah. So, well, it's very clear. One thing is very clear. All of that about all that, and this lady who comes to be called the mother of harlots has been re busy reproducing herself. How many churches in our world are now basically copying most of the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church? Well, well, back about the year 2000 or 20, uh, 2001, and there, there was 33,000 Christian denominations at that mm. time. And it, what's happened since then, I don't, I've don't, lost count, but 33,000. Mm -hmm. And how many of those basically follow the Roman Catholic Church? To some extent. But most of them keep Sunday. So, mm. that, uh, so well, most of them. Yeah. Go ahead. To re in Revelation 14, especially verse 8, that we are warned to get all of God's people out of Babylon and these false apostate daughters of Babylon as quickly as possible because those who remain will receive what? Mark. The mark of the beast. And those who receive the mark of the beast will eventually be totally annihilated. That warning is first given in Revelation 14 and is repeated with even greater power in Revelation 18, 1 to 4. So who should be responsible for giving that last great appeal to come out of Babylon? P appeal to come out of Babylon. How will they actually do it? From the well. Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Thursday, it says, Over the years, students of Bible pro prophecy have been following world events with great interest, particularly as they seem to relate to the end time. Think, for instance, about the role of the United States. As far back as 1851, some Adventists were identifying America as a second beast power, which was very remarkable identification given the status of the United States then. In the mid-1800s, the big powers were still the old world ones, Prussia, France, Austria-Hungary, and England. 
At that time, America had a peacetime army of about 20,000 men, about one-tenth the number of combatants at the Battle of Waterloo alone. In 1814, just 40 years earlier, the British invaded and burned Washington, D.C. In 1876, Sitting Bull's Braves wiped out General Custer's 7th U.S. Cavalry Regiment. Thus, even after some commentators identified the United States as the power that would one day enforce the mark of the beast on the world, the nation was still fighting Native Americans on its own soil and not always winning either. So doesn't that sound like a very powerful thing that's going to just sweep over and control the whole world? It didn't sound like that in 1850, did it? But it's become that way. Yeah. Guess what? God's right again. It's amazing, isn't it? The, the history of God, well, the history that God has predicted, predicted of our world is coming, for, coming to before our eyes. Look at Revelation 18, 1 to 4. After this, I saw another angel coming down out of heaven. He had great authority and his splendor brightened the whole earth. He cried out in a loud voice, She has fallen, great Babylon has fallen. She is now haunted by demons and unclean spirits. All kinds of filthy and hateful birds live in her. For all the nations have drunk her wine, the strong wine of her immoral lust. The kings of the earth practiced sexual immorality with her and the merchants of the world grew rich from her unrestrained lust. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out, my people, come out from her. You must not take part in her sins. You must not share in her punishment. Okay, so is there a group on living on this earth that are supposed to be giving that message? Yes. Well, 14. Go ahead. Revelation 14, we're told to, uh, to worship God mm -hmm. and to... Uh, and to preach the everlasting gospel. So, so are we doing that? Do we really know, and were we really preaching the gospel? Do we really know what the good, good news is? Uh, uh, some of the stuff of I hear, uh, I, I wouldn't subscribe to uh, among yeah. Adventists. Yep. Well, the picture suggests here that the devil will be more or less in charge of everything that occurs on planet Earth. It will be a dreadful, fearful time for God's faithful people. But even in the midst of those terrible times, God is still calling some of those in Babylon, my people. So who's going to convince those people to come out of Babylon and become a part of God's faithful people? Jesus and, is lifted up and yeah. he will draw them. Well, here's my question. Will others around them know that they have come out of Babylon and joined God's faithful people? No, because <coughs> they'll rationalize whatever it is they want to believe. They'll. Uh, In these final horrific days of this earth's history, Satan is going to do everything he possibly can to accomplish his original purpose of getting as many people as possible to worship him. In fact, what he would really like to do at this point in history, since he can't go back and do what he wanted to do earlier, what he would really like to do, he would like to have God just take his people he either destroy all of God's people here on this earth so there's no God-fearing people left, or have God take his people and disappear off to some other part of the world and just leave this earth and all the people on this earth to Satan. And this would be his kingdom. Is that going to work out for him? Probably not. Not at all. <laughs> okay, Myra? From the very beginning of the great controversy in heaven, it has been Satan's purpose to overthrow the law of God. It was to accomplish this that he entered upon his rebellion against the Creator. And, through, and though he was cast out of heaven, he continued the same warfare upon the earth to deceive men and thus lead them to transgress God's law is the object which he has steadfastly pursued. Whether this he accomplished by casting aside the law altogether or by rejecting one of its precepts, the result will ultimately be ultimately the same. He that offends in one point manifests contempt for the whole law. His influence and example 
are on the side of transgression, he becomes guilty of all. James 2.10. Great Controversy, page 582. So, in this final sequence of events that we're starting to talk about now, what is Satan trying to accomplish? Destroy God's people. Destroy God's people and to get as many people as possible here on planet Earth to hold him as ult in ultimate respect, to, to in effect worship him. So as we look around us, do we see the events predicted in the book of Revelation being fulfilled? People are becoming very self-centered mm -hmm. uh, and are getting very defensive about it. Well, where, where if you disagree with them, it's hate speech. The time. book of Revelation seems to suggest that the final issue is going to be over worship. Does that seem like a major issue in the world today? Well, well, worship is what you value, isn't it? Okay. So, yes, people worship money. You said last okay. time that when people worship money, they're worshiping Satan. Okay. Fame, power. Mm -hmm. Or if they seek to do their own will. And that could be money, could be lust, one thing or another, or... So we, we haven't spent a lot of time talking about the mark of the beast yet. Are there people who already have the mark of the beast? No. How do you know that? Ellen White said so. <laughs> <laughs> Ellen okay. White wrote quite some time ago. Yes. Right. right. Well, if the final issue is going to be on about worship, and Satan is, uh, Satan's ultimate goal is to get as many people as possible to worship him, Will people worship him unknowingly, or will they worship him knowingly? Both. Mm -hmm. So on the brain, you know, mark on the forehead or mark on the hand. So okay. some will do it knowingly, and some will just do it because it's expedient. But they still probably know that what they're doing. I mean, they still sort of join that side, even though they may not give full assent to. I think they'll still rationalize it yeah. as their own will. This is what I want to do, yeah. and this is, this is what's going to get me what I want. Ellen White says, seems to suggest that during the last days that there's going to be a decision going one way or the other. Mm -hmm. It'll be a clear one that's never been so clear before. Yeah. So I'm wondering what's going to happen to make Well, I'm going to make a suggestion right now. In the midst of, right in the midst of all this, there's going to be the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and what's called the latter rain. And then what's going to happen? Things are going to move quickly. Final movements will be rapid ones. Yep. People will understand the issues. At least most people will. And there's going to be that separation. Some are going to decide one side, some are going to decide the other side. Late in his life, um, uh, Dr. Provencia, Jack Provencia, had this idea of a catalyst that you, you take a solution and mm -hmm. it's one thing and then you take something very small which is a catalyst and put it in there and suddenly the whole thing changes. Mm -hmm. So he saw our church much like that as a catalyst that, that, that in the end will, will cause this big change. I hope so. I hope it'll be a good change. So now, for you people out there, after studying this lesson and listening to our discussion, do you feel you can clearly identify the sea beast as the Roman Catholic Church? Could you clearly identify the land beast as the United States of America? How can we be sure that we are always correctly worshiping the true God of heaven? What is the most common characteristic of false worship? What happens in false worship? Self-exaltation. Self to practice false worship means to worship something that is not worth it, anything that is not true to God's character and his government. 
Is there anything else we need to call the world to do besides coming out of Babylon? Well, they have to be called to something. Okay. It's not just into the void. Look at two very interesting passages. One is in Revelation 13 and the other is in Revelation 14. Revelation 13.10 says, Whoever is meant to be captured will surely be captured. Who is whoever is meant to be killed by the sword will surely be killed by the sword. This calls for endurance and faith on the part of God's people. What do we mean by endurance and faith on the part of God's people? Persevering in spite of the appearance of things. Uh, mm -hmm. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said uh, that God was able to deliver them, but even if he didn't deliver them, they still would not follow, uh, bow down and worship. So even though God may not deliver us or somebody we know, um, we still profess faith that he's, he's going to deliver everybody of his in mm -hmm. the end. Sounds like Job in a way, doesn't it? Yeah. So, though he slay me, I will still trust yeah. him. Mm -hmm. So right in the middle of talking about the two, Satan's two beasts, there's a call for endurance on the part of God's people. Then we go to Revelation 14, and we, we read about God's side and all the, re, all the messages about his side. And at the end of that, we read in verse 12, this calls for endurance on the part of God's people, those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to Jesus, or have the faith of Jesus, either one. It could be either way in the, in the Greek. So here we have this same call in both Revelation 13 and 14. So what does that imply? Just giving verbal consent to the idea that God's on the right side? Consistent or, choices. Settling into the truth so that we cannot be moved. It's yeah. One, one expression. Not be easy, and not be easy time for the faithful followers of God. We must give up self-worship. Guess who's the expert at self-worship? Satan. 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 Yes. Absolutely. We're and pretty we, good at it too, aren't we? Pretty good. Deep we've had lots position. of. We've had a lot of a lot of practice. So we must choose instead a faithful, God-centered worship. And how will God's faithful people do that? In the great prophetic timetables which we see in Scripture, what events are still to take place that haven't taken place yet? Second coming. Only those events directly connected with the second coming of Jesus. In the millennium and the third coming. Well, yeah, after. Yeah, I guess if you want to go beyond, yes. Is it possible that Protestants and other religious groups will come to respect and even reverence the Roman Catholic Church once again? Well, the Roman Catholic Church is pleading with all Protestant churches to come back to the Mother Church. The Lutheran Church and the Anglican Church have already signed agreements of cooperation with the Roman Catholic Church. Notice the following headlines. Jim, I think you have some of those headlines. U.S. Lutherans approve document recognizing agreement with the Catholic Church. Reformed churches endorse Catholic Lutheran accord on key Reformation disputes. And then the Anglicans affirm Lutheran Catholic agreement endorse Roman, excuse me, Reformation anniversary. And that was done uh, about uh, Oh, what, what, what was that, about 10 years ago? Yeah, a while back. I guess it was uh, on, uh, no, that's, it's just Headline a reference to 2016. it. 2016. Yeah. yeah. Well, we would like to challenge you out there to get a copy of our handout. It's available at our website, uh, theox .org. That's theox org, And you can look up these references and uh, see for yourself. And these are just a few of the reports of cooperation between the Roman Catholic Church and other church groups. Some of us, us have seen whole videos where people from the Catholic Church have come and made major presentations to Protestant groups. So what's happening? In the midst of this proliferation of churches that Jim mentioned, is it safe just to return to the more respectable and established churches? Or would that simply be falling into the Laodicean trap? 
I mean, aren't Lutherans and Anglicans pretty <coughs> traditional and established? Yeah. Are we as a relatively small Protestant church up to the task before us? Back to the catalyst. I hope. Catalysts must be powerful things. Look at Revelation 13, verse 12 again. It used the vast authority, this is the first, this second beast, it used the vast authority of the first beast in its presence. It forced the earth and all who live on it to worship the first beast whose wound had healed. That's so, one thing God, it, with his love, cannot force. Okay. Because if you got force, there is no love. There's, there's no choice except uh, at the barrel of a gun or whatever. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, in order to... If, if the devil is going to do, use all the force he could possibly muster to force everybody on earth to worship him, what's going to happen on the other side? We're just going to bow down and worship him? God is perfectly capable of protecting his kids. But, on the but we've line. already read in two different places, they're going to have to endure. Right. That means it's not going to be easy. That's right. But on the full armor of God. But on the full armor of God. And him, God protecting us, doesn't mean that we will live in this life That's right. longer. It doesn't mean we're going to spend our time at 31 Flavors or <laughs> something like that. <laughs> well, in Revelation 13, 3 and 8, we discovered that this beast has, a, uh, has another characteristic not mentioned in Daniel 7 and 8. It receives a deadly wound, but that wound is healed. Incredible as it may seem, the Roman Catholic Church, only a few decades after receiving that deadly wound, what was the deadly wound again? Pope taken captive. The Pope was taken captive. His property, at one time the Catholic Church owned the whole central section of the, of the country, what we would call now the country of Italy. That was all taken away from him. He lost his power authority, he was put in prison. He died. That sounds like a deadly wound. Only a few years after that, the Catholic Church arose again to the point where they declared the infallibility of the Pope in the year 1870. What about the other six heads? Well, we don't, we don't know. We haven't, we haven't been told about those. Don't you think that the, maybe the, that ought to be a package of knowledge right there? Should be. I mean, to make sure that the the, the deadly wound one is correct as far as the interpretation goes? Well, let's read these verses once more. The second beast was allowed to breathe life into the image of the first beast. Now, we said the second beast is, beast is clearly identifies as, as what? The land beast is? U.S. The United States of America. The first beast is? Rome. That the devil has given its, uh, his authority to pagan and then papal Rome. It's a system. It's not a person. It's a system. So United States will breathe life into the image of the first beast so that the image could talk and put to death all those who would not worship it. The beast forced all the people, small and great, rich and poor, slave and free, to have a mark placed on their right hands or on their foreheads. No one could buy or sell without having this mark, that is, the beast's name or the number that stands for the name. In other words, Satan is determined to do what to anyone who disagrees with him? Kill him. Destroy him. Yeah. yeah. How could we ever return to the day when a religious entity, even one enforced by the powers of a nation as great as the United States of America, will be able to force people to obey its dictates under penalty of death? If you, right now, if you announced in the national newspapers, there's a religi religious law coming in and it's going to force everybody to do something, what would be the response? ACL, you would stand up and fight it. There would be a great outcry against that sort of doesn't thing. Even, it doesn't even seem possible, does it? So what is it that most people in our world actually worship today? Is it fame, money, power, influence? Well, we've read about these beasts. I need to finish up here. What would it take to get the whole world to worship the devil and his surrogate, the Roman Catholic Church? 
Surely this cannot be a traditional worship with churches and some kind of organizational structure. Will worship take on a new form? Or could things become so chaotic worldwide, it's another possibility, that people will do almost anything to get back to some form of stability? Remember that this will become such an issue that blanket death decrees will be signed and passed by the United States government and then by many, if not all, governments around the world against those who refuse to agree and worship the devil. Considering how incredible the disagreement is in our, par I mean, our, our Congress in these days, does it seem possible that something like this could be passed? We're going to pass a law that everybody has to worship the devil. I, you know, you just, it blows your mind to even think about it. There's got to be a big crisis ahead of that. Crisis and then this Im imitation of Christ appearing through the uh, devil that seems to be able to solve the crisis and so forth will, and so on. Will we be expected to make a stand like the three men, the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did? I think so. Yeah. What kind of worship will these governments be dictating or Commanding? We know. Whatever, whatever form of worship, it will be identified by the receiving of a mark on the hand or the forehead. Revelation 13, 6. This should remind us of Deuteronomy 6, 7, and 9. What do we read there? Remember the people of Israel were told to do what? And we don't have time to read the whole thing. So how will this actually work out? How will people actually receive the mark of the beast? three points or four points, this power is different from the beast of the sea. It is not a religious, it is, it is not worshipped. It is only a political, it can, it can kill and functions as an economic power. It determines who could buy and sell. Two, this power comes into prominence after the beast of the sea and it begins to act immediately after the beast of the sea receives its wound, hence by the end of the 18th century. This power has a reass re uh, reassuring character. It looks like the lamb supposed to be like Jesus, as a symbol of Jesus Christ and his vulnerability. Yet it speaks like a dragon. It has a tremendous power. Also, it comes from the land, a sparsely populated part of the earth, until the beast from the sea, unlike the beast of the sea. The power exercises an important political and cultural influence on the world. It is a superpower. Well, we're running out of time. We still feel like things we'd like to read. We know that the Pope is highly respected around the world and we wonder where we will stand. Our kind and loving Father. Here we read in the book of Revelation about two sides who will be mortal enemies, deadly enemies. And the devil will be determined to destroy and get rid of anybody living here on planet Earth that does not worship him. And yet we want to be faithful. We want to live through that time. We want to be faithful to you. How will it be possible? We know that your Holy Spirit will have to be by our side, guiding us and directing us and helping us, and your power be with us in order to stand through that troublesome time. May it be so is our prayer in Jesus' name.